Hey y'all, you may have noticed it's been a long time since my last video. I have nothing to say about that other than I'm sorry. As you may have noticed by my very new surroundings, I have moved again. I'm kind of a nomad at the moment, so this is going to happen a few times in the next couple of months. Moving on from my very relevant personal life, I would like to get to the meat and potatoes of the first part of Smith's chapter 11. As a quick reminder, we are going to be discussing the concept of rent. In the introduction to this discussion, Smith talks about different types of produce that sometimes can and sometimes cannot afford rent. And he says the type of produce that always can afford rent is food. And that is what we are going to be discussing in this section right now. Smith says that food is the type of production that will always demand rent, and that is because food is always in demand. There is always going to be somebody out there who needs it, and there is always going to be someone out there who is willing to pay for it. Although rarely a perfect equilibrium, it can usually purchase enough labor that it takes to maintain it. Meaning that the amount of money that it will be sold for will be more than enough to cover whatever costs were initially put into it. This means that there will always be something left over for rent. So if you dedicate your land to growing corn more often than not, what you will sell the abundance of your corn for is going to be enough to pay off the wages of your workmen and pay off your own profits, your own or your investors' profits, and this will always leave something left over for the landlord. Even if your land isn't really fertile enough to produce a lot of corn in order to cover your costs, you're going to then take that land because you're not an idiot and use it to raise some other kind of food that will produce you some kind of profit. Unless they are being subsidized by the government, people won't use land that can be turned a profit on for something that isn't profitable. Even in the most barren of lands, whatever you decide to turn your land into will produce enough to cover all your costs and leave a small amount for the landlord. The more fertile the land, the more it produces, the better off everybody is all around. Because the land is more fertile, you can get more production per square meter, no matter what it is you're using it for. And it also takes less labor to maintain it because the land in and of itself is more fertile. This means you have spending less money on wages, but you still have a large profit and that leaves a lot more over for the landlord. If there's more left over for the landlord, that means that rent is going to be higher, which means that the more fertile the land, the higher the rent is going to be. But rent doesn't only get more expensive with fertility. As we all know, rent gets more expensive with location. Two pieces of land with similar fertility are going to get very different rents based on their location. If you are further away from the city, then the cost of bringing your goods to market is higher, which means that your wages are higher, which means there's less money left over for rent, so therefore rent will be lower. When countries are in a more advanced state of wealth and they have better roads and ways of transporting things, the major rent gaps between these locations does narrow. And Smith says this is actually one of the greatest signs of improvement in any country. Having better forms of transportation and ways to move goods and services around your country is an issue Smith has discussed at length in the past in Chapter 3. This is very good for breaking up monopolies and ensuring proper competition since country farms can properly compete on an even playing field. But Smith spends the majority of this section talking about corn. Smith argues that whatever it is you're using your land for, the rent that you are going to be charged is going to be based on how much you would have gotten if you were growing corn. And this is true for whatever the main sustenance of your country is. In Smith's case, this was corn. In China at the time, this was rice. And he discusses that, but he also says that rice has different problems because it has to be grown on specific types of land. Generally speaking, though, whatever the main sustenance of your country is, it w is exactly what is going to dictate the rate of rent for fields around your country. Majority of this section of the chapter is dedicated to figuring out how he came to this conclusion. Let's say you have two fields and they are of equal size and equal fertility. One, you produce corn, and the other, you produce beef. The produce of the corn field will feed a lot more people for a lot longer. It also takes a lot more labor to produce, but your profits will be higher because you will be producing more. Now let's say you only have one field and you have to choose, do you want to use it to raise beef or do you want to use it to cultivate corn? If beef and corn were the same price per pound, this would be no contest. Obviously, since you can produce a lot more corn and therefore have a lot more surplus to pay back all your wages and profits and rent and all that wonderful stuff, you would use it for corn. But beef and corn aren't the same price, which is why this isn't such an easy decision. Right now, we know that beef is a lot more expensive than corn. Let's please ignore for a moment that, at least in the United States, corn is so heavily subsidized that it is worth almost nothing and therefore put in almost everything. Smith says that the relative values of these very, very different species of food have changed a lot over time. Let's go back to the beginning. Unimproved wilds basically made up the entire country and therefore was used for pasture for beef. Meat is abundant, but cultivated corn to make bread, not so much. Now, because more bread is more expensive than meat, it pays to start cultivating land to produce corn to make bread because it's very expensive. But then what happens? As more and more people cultivate more land to make corn, it becomes cheaper. We we'll refer back to our good friend supply and demand and remember that as supply increases, prices fall and the competition starts to change its direction. Because as more and more land is cultivated with the use of corn, there is less and less land for pasture. Less pasture means less meat. Less meat means lower supply, which means prices rise. And now the world looks very much like it does today, with beef being more expensive than bread. As land gets taken up more and more for cultivation, any land that is not used for cultivation is currently used for pastures. But that means that they're giving up on the rent and profits of cultivated corn, 
and the price of the beef is going to reflect that. And so it happens that the rent of any land dedicated to pasture is actually regulated by what would have been the production if they had used that land for corn. This equilibrium, however, between meat and corn can only be maintained after the land has been quote-unquote improved, meaning in country in an advanced state of wealth. Back to our location argument, Smith points out that land around a city is much more often used for pasture and that it is much more expensive. So you would think that that rent is actually regulated by pasture, but it isn't. It just happens that land is more valuable as pasture closer to the city because things like corn can be imported from elsewhere and you need things like fresh milk and horse stables right around the corner. This is actually something that happens in our time as well. Or maybe it's just the state of society in which we currently exist. Motivation to use land to be cultivated for corn around a city shrinks all the time because you can bring that stuff in from far away, but you need the land closer to the city to be used for other things. Location actually plays a very large role in the regulation of rent. Surprise, surprise. Local advantages like having fresh milk near the city will mean that the rent in that place is regulated by that trade. But any place where no local advantage is specifically found, all rent will be dictated by the price of corn. Smith says that a very large majority of all wealthy countries is dedicated to cultivation of food. Either food for people or food for cattle, it doesn't really matter. The rent and profit of these productions regulate the rent and profit of any other cultivated land. If you decided to say grow turnips because turnips turned a higher profit and all of a sudden they stopped turning less of a profit, you would very quickly turn your field to produce corn. And if turnips had a high profit margin, then you would turn your corn field into turnips. But because corn is the main sustenance, it will always serve as the benchmark because it's always in demand. Now, obviously there are other productions out there that are going to turn higher profits than corn or beef. But Smith says they can't have anything to do with regulating the rent of land because there's a lot more expense that usually goes into these productions because they're more rare. Now, it doesn't have to be corn that does all of this predicting, but Smith argues it usually is. This is because corn yields much higher crops and feeds much more people than other forms of cultivation. It also doesn't require any form of specialized land like rice. Smith says a very large amount of his chapter comparing different types of cultivation and, and in different countries and different time periods, but he always comes back to the same conclusion. There's always going to be one crop that is going to dictate the rent of land. It is going to be the crop that best sustains the most amount of people and has the highest amount of yield. More often than not, Smith argues that this crop is corn. So now that he's dealt with what dictates the price of rent when it comes to use for food, Smith will move on to talk about clothing and lodging, which he says are the next greatest wants of man. But for that, he has an entirely different subchapter, which we will hopefully talk about next time. If you found this video helpful and you want to hear more about Adam Smith's theories, you can watch the entire playlist from the beginning. If you want to hear about how clothing and lodging dictate rent of land, you can click the subscribe button and make sure to get notified when I upload the next video. You can keep up with me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that wonderful social media stuff. I'll see you next time.